Hey there, banditos. Welcome to the latest episode of the Dollar Bin Bandits, where, as always, we fling open those doors of your local comic book shop. You haven't done that in a while, guys. And talk to your favorite comic book creators of yesterday and today. And before we do any of that, let's introduce ourselves, because we're here together, all three of us, for the first time in quite a while. I'm Joe Marcello. I'm Warren Phillips. I'm Mike Farah. And we hope everyone is having a happy, safe Halloween. And uh, make sure to check your apples for razor blades, because apparently that was a thing. Mm. Uh, Today, we're bringing you an absolutely fabulous episode. Great interview. And uh, this is an Orlock only episode. Ha, ha, ha. Ha. I'll throw out the reference. Get it. Uh, specifically, this is uh, Oren interviewing Matt Wagner and Kelly Jones. You may know these guys from some awesome work they've done before. Uh, Matt Wagner, obviously, from a little book called Grendel and another little book called Mage, which I just d- dove back into recently and just dis- rediscovered how awesome it is. And you may know Kelly Jones from his just amazing and numerous Batman vampire or Batman Dracula series. Really great stuff. Yeah, this is like uh, the Lugosi and Karloff of uh, horror book guys coming together. Uh, Being able to talk to them is really a a dream come true. This Dracula book, it's phenomenal. Everything they told me about it, the research they've done. uh, You're going to find out that you want to read this too because... Uh, they put so much time and detail into this. It's absolutely incredible. Yeah, this project is kickstarting now, and I am kicking myself for not being on the interview with Oren because these guys are masters of their craft, and they're pouring their heart into this project, which is, from what I read, the first of 12 graphic novels on Dracula, which uh, this is absolutely epic. So please check that out. Go to Kickstarter and look for Dracula the Impaler, Volume 1. Um, and this is Matt Wagner and Kelly Jones. I'm Warren Phillips, and I am beyond honored today to have two living legends with us. I'm talking about Mr. Matt Wagner and Mr. Kelly Jones and their new Dracula book coming out. Guys, thank you so much for taking the time. You betcha. It's a total pleasure. I'm glad to be here. So I'll start with the first question is, how did this friendship first begin? We met many, many years ago uh, when we were both uh, contributing art. And uh, I will say Kelly did the lion's share of it. But we both uh, drew part of uh, uh, the Season of Mists uh, story arc on Neil Gaiman's Sandman. Um, I was one little chapter in the midst of Kelly's epic uh, (laughs) rest of the story. We Yeah, Um, we were in Detroit. Yeah, we met at a few cons and a few uh, uh, store signings. And we just kind of immediately hit it off. The same... Same sense of humor, same love of horror fiction, um, about the same age, same reference points. I mean, it just all just clicked. Uh, I think I think for me, it was I remember it clearly because I wanted to I accepted going to a show and Matt was going to be there. And that was one of the reasons I didn't know he would be. And in the area we were going to be before when everyone got in there, I think it was at the airport even before. And um, but he's the guy I wanted to see. He was the guy I was following reading his stuff and whatnot and he stood out to me and it was one of those things where i just you know one of the good things of when you're when you do this is you get to get behind the scenes you get to behind the tables you can go meet people and that was the guy i wanted to meet and there was a lot of good people there but that's the guy i focused on and what i always remember matt probably doesn't because you know but (laughs) i i locked eyes on him I locked eyes on him and then they introduced me and he locked eyes on me. And I, and I think, I think he wants to meet me too. So Mm -hmm. we, we sat down and uh, I went over to him. I shook his hand. I said, man, it is such a pleasure to meet you. And same thing. And then after that, it was like, I'd known him for years because we liked the same stuff. We laughed at the same stuff. We hated the same stuff. We drank the same stuff. Um, Everything was, was like that. Yes. (laughs) And, and, uh, and it was a, a guy and he was one of those when you're you're lucky when they say stuff that you've never heard of or you you always thought you disagreed with whatever, but you were fascinated by their opinion. And you realize this guy thinks he's a critical thinker and that doesn't happen too often. And he was totally independent because I kind of felt alone at that time, even in the mainstream of just doing what I do and everyone else, you know, uh, was doing what they were doing. And I was just not 
not part of it. And here is a guy who was very successful, very well regarded, and his opinion mattered. It's like Darcy, his good opinion mattered. You know, you don't want to lose it. So um, I was I was very taken with it. He introduced me to Tim Sale, uh, who I loved him too. And I got along with Tim really, really well too. And I went, wow, this is great. Um, so it was, it was, I've always been more on uh, of the independent mindset anyway. Um, uh, but I did, I did, I just didn't have the connections for it. I didn't know anyone in that. And, and you, and, but this was, this would satisfy that. So I always really dug it. I also, when, when I went to or uh, Portland, he had the, to this day, he doesn't live in that house anymore. The single finest studio I'd ever been in the single, it was in a turret. You remember Matt, you had that yeah. turret mm -hmm. and he had a sink in his studio too. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I love that. And you could see all the way around and it was kind of foresty and stuff. Um, I loved it. I, I still, to this day, go, that's the best fucking studio I had ever seen. My studio now is nicer, dude. You got to come out. I, 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 <laughs> I, 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 but it was like, it was like a horror film. I mean, you had to go up these stairs to it and mm -hmm. it was just, it was, I don't know how he got all the shit up there, but I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, you know, and uh, similarly, you know, I, I, Kelly's right. I had wanted to meet him because, you know, you looked around in the, the, that that eighties time was a time when uh, DC particularly was kind of stretching their wings in regards to style. You know, you didn't really they weren't really relying on a house style. Yet at the same time, you know, here's this guy that draws like Kelly. You're like, what the hell is this? You know, <laughs> it really doesn't look like any anything over at DC. Yeah. Um, so I was always interested in people that just had their own way of doing shit, and they weren't compromising. They weren't trying to draw like the latest style. You could just tell they were what they were and <clears throat> everything that was inside them came out on the page, you know? Yep. And that's, that's where the, that's where the fellow traveler thing happened. You just yep. realize is fellow traveler and he's going to have the same headaches as me. He's going to have the same, uh, uh, road to follow and, and all the same problems. But what was great was we were all willing to give it up rather than do what it took to stay. And that's the kind of people I wanted to be around. Then you knew, well, if I'm putting up with it, he's putting up with it. We're all putting up with it. Luckily, uh, we got to be around people who accepted it. And it, there was a, a very good climate for independent people at that time. Um, I'm not saying it isn't now, but it was at that. It was coming out of this homogen, really homogenized to what we were doing. And we didn't look like image. We didn't look like. Uh, anything going well, on image, image came a little later than when you a little I later up friends, but it was you know? starting to percolate you could see that what they called it was the west coast style then mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you could see it starting to go and but we were doing fine doing our own thing and, and he, drew, he, he drew an utterly different batman for me it was completely oh, yeah. opposite yeah. Yeah. and i loved it short cape short ears and i thought man he's nailing that it, it's yeah. it's it's mysterious it's film noir it i was totally digging it i i think i said to him the other day i, I when i was in the offices at dc on the, one of those occasions i wanted they had a big shot of a, a double page spread he had done and it was in xerox but i wanted to steal it i kept i really wanted that and they couldn't you know we there was a reference thing or something but man i kept going back there i never thought to just call him and say can you send me a xerox of it i yeah. just there's something better but there is something better about stealing something yeah yeah uh, and Oren, maybe to presuppose your next question, uh, then over the years, we had just continually said to each other every time we saw each other, or we used to talk on the phone a lot, just, uh, you know, comic book artists do this a lot. We lead such an isolated lifestyle locked into our drawing table. Unless you're in a group studio, you call your buddies and you just sit there and chat while you're drawing, you know, right. Right. and we used to do that a lot. And, uh, and we would always talk about, hey, man, you and I got to team up on something big someday, you know. Well, there was things and I also liked about Matt. He had a similar thing. He had a he had a civilian wife. I had a civilian wife, right? Mm -hmm. So we were in the normal world a lot of the time, uh, and you know, wives who could care less about it. Um, so we didn't talk. It's you didn't a real nice, sobering influence. It really it was. Is. It's it a is. leveler. It's really great. <laughs> I always tell I always tell people if you're going to get with someone from outside, so so you can get away from it. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a lot of these things going on where we could where we could relate to it. I think one of the best shows I'd ever been was in Portland where it was with Matt and Tim and primarily we just we would do our we would do our thing 
but then get away just to talk just mm-hmm. to, to bullshit and it was it was wonderful uh, i remembered that as being that's what this this is what i thought it was going to be and it, and it was uh it, it it was really feeling a part of something and why it took this long is bullshit we should have done it earlier <laughs> yeah it's not so much bullshit is you know you, you both got your own gigs going on and you know you know how life is you know that yeah, i know everybody has buddies that they wish they spent more time with you know yeah, yeah. and uh you know our lives and our careers just kind of took us in various different directions always kind of orbiting around each other in yep. the in the uh in the industry and in the 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 uh aesthetic climate yeah um but then just a couple of years ago, I had posted I to... something on uh, Facebook and, and Kelly chimed in with that that timeless echo that we both knew. We really got to do something together someday. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. Uh, by this point, I had been percolating on this Dracula idea for a while. I mean, I, I had literally spent decades thinking about how am I going to do Dracula someday? Because I didn't want to do just another adaptation of the book. And, uh, and I finally had my take on it. And uh, so I contacted him and said, dude, are you serious? Because I think I really got the perfect sublime idea for us for the two of us together and but it's going to mean four to five years together four to five years of of concentrating on this you know and luckily hit him at just the right time and he was he was into it and i was into it well i would reached a point of uh uh wanting wanting that freedom i had when i first started uh as specifically with dc and um in those days editors Control their own fiefdom so all you had to do is get the okay from your editor and you could do what you wanted and those days are kind of gone now so uh um when matt said this uh, i i first of all i absolutely adored the idea and it worked just him telling me i adored every little part of it and i and it so it didn't become a difficult thing at all to say yeah i'll commit to this i'll do it whatever because it was spectacular and I just I love something where it doesn't need me to be successful. I love it when it's that good and you go, OK, I want that material. Um, I always embarrass Matt. I think he's a genius. I think he's one of the great people who've done this. And I wanted to do something with him because I think that. And every time I read something, I go this. it There's a um, a level of of gravitas to it, but it's fucking fun. It's just, it's a delightful read. It's what comics are supposed to be. So, so, Kelly always says that what I do is literary pulp. Yes. And, and I always I always hold that up as kind of a banner. It's like, yeah, I like Well, it. I remember. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember that. And I it was early on in this. And we were just talking. And I was giving him all these great praise like that. And, and I'm going, you know, in, in a horror thing and it's all this vi- whatever and it's so deep and there's all these levels of meaning and you do it whether you get it or not. It's still success. But but if you are to do a contextual deep dive into it, it's all there. And I hear Matt very sadly on the other side go, oh, I, I like blood and sex, too. <laughs> that's what I want. You know, it's like, yeah, it's what you want. I go, OK, that's what he wants is. The good stuff, it's it's a like an uh old independent Roger Corman film. Anything you want to do, but I gotta have this element every 10 to 15 minutes. And man. I remember uh many, many years ago when my parents were still alive, uh, my mom said to me, I think your approach is too erudite for your audience. And I said, Yeah, but they don't notice it. Yeah. That's that's the whole point. That's that's what I want. I don't want them to notice yeah. the amount of thought I'm putting into it. I want oh. them to just experience the vis- visceral quality of it. You know. Yeah, and the and the beauty of that approach is it changes over time. The, the when you read it, it means something different. It it then becomes a classic, and then it becomes part of your essential library. And Matt was producing that regularly. Mm-hmm. I got lucky early on at DC because I kept getting things that would would have some heaviness to it. But Matt was doing it on his own. I had to hope you know and um at that point uh and i wanted to be stereotyped i wanted to be stereotyped as the horror guy Mm -hmm. i wanted that so those people would come to me i wanted it to be i wanted something dark and all this i know everyone was afraid of that i desperately wanted it no one else was really doing it in where i was at so i i i'm give it to me and um, I bet that's funny because I remember a famous uh, when Christopher Reeve was first uh, cast as Superman, he apparently turned to Sean Connery to ask for advice about about uh, uh, stereotyping, typecasting. Mm-hmm. And Sean said, yeah, get there first. 
then yeah. worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure they want to stereotype. Yeah, you, exactly. You yep. know? Um, so I was, I was, uh, I was fine with that because I didn't want to, um, you know, when I, when I first came to DC, the other than Swamp Thing, I can't think of any other real horror book they were doing because Vertigo kind of came later and then uh, all the British writers. So I was happy to get Dead Man and, and I was happy to get, uh, when I went to Portland with Aliens, where I got to do a horror version of Aliens, not like soldiers fighting aliens. Hell, and, who uh, who edited Dead Man? Who let you draw it like that? Uh, to begin with, it was Barbara Kiesel. Oh, was it? Okay. And mm-hmm. she and she had the good sense to say, you know, I like mainstream. I don't really care for what you would do a- in that sense, but I want you to do more of it because you're doing something different. And that's the best mm-hmm. editorial thing you can have. Someone who says, I'm more of a mainstream, clean art kind of a person, but I'm really digging what you're doing, so go further with it. I didn't mm-hmm. really ask permission. And that was the independent part. I just drew it and turned it in saying, well, if they fire me, they fire me. Then Rich Bruning took over and Rich Bruning's. Oh, uh, really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then he said the same thing to me and essentially said, I don't know what you're doing, but I do know that it's getting oohs and ahs in the office. So keep doing it. Right. I don't think Rich really wanted to be an editor. He was more of an art director guy. Yeah. He, he was more um, design guy. Yeah. Uh, so. I got to be left alone, the, the perfect storm. And it, it's happened with Dracula. I was left alone. You know, just come up with your own thing. And uh and I always treated Dead Man like the last job I'd ever have, right? I figured editors will not like it. And then they did, and I said, Well, fans will hate this because it ain't Neil Adams. And I and I love Neil Adams. You can't do it, Neil Adams, though. Yeah. Everybody mm-hmm. who did Dead Man up to that point was doing visions of Neil. Yep. And and so I just figured, and that's just a dead end because you're never as good as Neil. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Uh, I had the I had the fortune or misfortune to follow him twice, Dead Man and then Batman. And you just that is a long, long shadow that man casts. And and they're bri- He's brilliant. I mean, I look at those now. I like him even more now because mm-hmm. I can truly appreciate what he did. But you cannot do what he did, you know. And um, I had the good fortune of Neil telling me that he says you solved my problem. Kid, you solved my problem. You went on your own and you did your thing. But he was a big fan of what I was doing. And that was very encouraging. And and um, but that's the independent part. That's the part. There's that part of me. I mean, normal Kelly's here, but Art Kelly is a weirdo and he makes those bad decisions where, where you can get fire going. Yeah, but I like him looking dead. Or yeah, yeah, I, yeah I love, yeah, I love working with ears, the ears. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and that's that's the independent part. That's the part that said maybe I should have been in an underground book, but, um, but it worked and yeah. it attracted. Well, now the, you are an underground book. Literally. Yeah, I am. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 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 it We're attracts, in a tomb. <laughs> when you do that, it attracts the right people, yeah. right? Whether they're fans or they're other creators. And Matt was a biggie for me. Actually, one of the best things that happened to me at DC was Matt wrote in Grendel a really nice review in the back of his book of when I was doing Batman. So I bought a couple issues and I clipped out the the defaced the book, but I clipped it out and I mailed it in, in those days. You had to. I sent it to my editors saying this gives me legitimacy. Like this <laughs> I, I wish I'd made a copy of what I wrote him, but I said this gives me legitimacy. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, at that point they didn't know I knew Matt and Matt didn't tell me he was going to do that. It just happened. But I still have that in my studio. Well, right on. I, I still have it on my wall. I always look at it and go, okay, I, I, there you go. You know, when I question, I go, he did. So it was, it's, and also Matt's far more professional than I am, <laughs> you know, <laughs> far, far more professional. Though he's all independent, he's he's far more professional. I uh, I I am very emotional. Matt is very practical. Um, I, t- uh, but but I trust him. So when he says this is he wants to do this or that or whatever, uh, I I trust him. How many guys can come to you and say, "Hey, I'm going to do De- Dracula," and your heart sinks, right? Because you're going. Dracula, we've done it a million times. <laughs> but when he said it, I went, ooh, there's going to be something there. And it was exactly, it exceeded all my hopes. And um, anyone who's seen this so far says that same reaction I had to reading the script. 
they have not read this before. Yeah, in fact, <clears throat> I recently had uh, so my co-writer on Sandman Mystery Theater, Steve Steve Siegel, was here in town for a. Uh, uh, he actually officiates weddings, and he was. <laughs> He was here in town officiating a wedding and he said, Hey, I'm, I'm in town. I said, well, oh, great. Come on by for lunch. And we'll, you know, I, I cooked him lunch here at our house. Took him downstairs and showed him Dracula. And he, he told me later, he said, when you told me you were doing Dracula, he had just that reaction that Kelly was talking about. I was like, seen that. Yeah. And I started showing it to him. He's like, Whoa, haven't seen that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. After that, Steve got, sent me a DM and he had said, uh, I want you to know, I think you guys did something really, this is, this is great. This is important. And well, I, that was awesome. Go ahead, Ari. Um, right. We're rattling on here. I'm sure you've got actual oh, fun. And it's, it's awesome. <laughs> and uh, Matt, you were saying for many years you were trying to put this together. And like you guys were saying, Dracula, it's been done many times. What kind of research did you do to sort of find an angle or uh, a different way to look at it that might not have been done before that's your own voice? Well, uh, you know, anybody that's a big fan of the book knows that, you know, Dracula is such a magnetic and, and compelling character, you know. Um, and, you know, I would even go as far as to say he's arguably the most famous character in all literary history, you know, maybe next to Sherlock Holmes. Maybe they're on a seesaw together, you know. Um, but, you know, I mean, there's a million other very famous characters. None of them bleed into the popular culture. None of them have a million Halloween costumes like both <laughs> Sherlock and Dracula. Um, and uh, and again, uh, for most of the narrative, he's off stage. You know, aside from the the very indelible scene where uh, Jonathan Harker goes to his castle in Transylvania at the beginning, which goes on for a decent amount of time. Once he goes to London, he's hardly on stage at all. It's just uh, his shadowy presence that that kind of haunts and infects the uh, the actions of the our heroes, you know. So you know, that really struck me that, God damn, here's this character. Uh, what a, a, a popular analogy that everybody will recognize is Hannibal Lecter in Silence of the Lambs. Mm -hmm. Steals that fucking movie. He's on screen 16 minutes out of that entire two plus hours runtime. 16 minutes. And Dracula is the same in, in the original novel, you know? So I had always wanted more Dracula. You know, when you read Tomb of Dracula, the Marvel book, he's on stage more. Mm -hmm. Um uh, most of the screen adaptations try to get him on stage more because, of course, you know, they're, he's their star actor, so they want to make use of their actor's time on screen. But they still kind of regulate him to the shadows <clears throat> to some degree. And, you know, when I read the uh, original novel, I have like three or four different annotated versions of it. So I really got to know the novel very well. I bought a copy of uh, a facsimile of uh, Stoker's uh, original notes. They are still in existence in a whole, a whole compact in a uh, small museum in Philadelphia. And I lived in Philadelphia for almost 10 years and didn't know this. I'm kicking my ass now that I never went to see these. Um, got to know those. Uh, you know, the, the neat thing about Dracula is there are all these hints in the narrative about his history, about his persona, you know, his interaction with his three brides. It, it's hardly there at all. And yet it's so evocative. And you know, there's so much more history there with each of those vampire women. How did each of them come under his thrall? You know, what is his history uh, as a warlord in the 15th century? You know, <clears throat> then once he gets to London, what the fuck's he doing there when he's off screen? He's obviously doing something. He's not just laying around, you know. Uh, there's a scene where uh, Jonathan and Mina are down in London and they and Jonathan happens to see him just by happenstance on the on the street. And all of a sudden he's turned young and he looks hardy and 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 he's following a woman down the street. So, you know, he's up to something. Right. So all that shit just haunted me for years. And uh, and I just felt like at some point I, I felt like I knew the material. I had read enough about. Vlad the Impaler, the original uh, 15th century uh, Valachian warlord. Um, and I finally got a, a handle on it, which was to, again, not tell the same old story, not translate uh, Stoker's text into comics, tell the stories around his text, tell the stories that come before it, tell the stories that come around the edges of it, and that are basically hidden in the shadows of his narrative. 
And uh, and once I once I opened that door, I found like, oh, yeah, this is the way to go. And and he very briefly in the book, he so indelibly defines Dracula's persona, his character, his carriage, his uh, his physique. Um, all that was there. So all I had to do was take that and just apply that to other scenarios based on um uh, based on the uh, the hints that are in the novel. Now, one thing I will offer as a kind of tantalizing hint is that uh, it just occurred to me that I've got to come up with some really, really special way that he becomes a vampire. The thought of him just getting bitten by another vampire, that's boring as shit. It's got to be, for him to be the most famous vampire of all time, it's got to be something significant, you know? And finally, I stumbled upon it and was able to was able to work it out, you know? And and I think it works really really well. So that's the phone conversation we had. That right there, what he did when when he was explaining to me what this is going to be, and he all of those things in there. I went, yeah, you're right. Yeah, I never thought of it. And I have read these things inside out and backwards. Thought I knew it all. Didn't know anything. And I'm going, yeah. What did he do? Yeah. How did he become? Yeah, he couldn't just be bit. Hey, no one would just bite Vlad the Impaler. No, he <laughs> so how did it happen? And when you're doing that and someone's posing those questions, you go, I got to do that. This is all great, because if I want the answers, I got to know someone reading is going to want the answers. And additionally, our approach to Dracula or my my initial approach to Dracula was. I'm not going for a romantic approach, you know, no. so many of the incarnations uh, have him as this. uh this romantic character, you know, there's a lot I love about the Coppola version, but there's a lot I fucking hate about the Coppola version. And the biggest part, aside from the casting, I think the casting is all for shit. Um, <laughs> the filmmaking's terrific, but this whole thing of the, you know, his reincarnated love and he's, you know, Mina's his, uh, his, his true love. And, you know, it's like that's nowhere in the novel. Our, our Dracula is a fucking monster from beginning to end. And just like Hannibal Lecter, you know, there's a there's a definite charm there. There's a definite like, you know, you you he he convinces you to let your defenses down a little bit here and there, and then suddenly you realize, whoop, nope, 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 he's really dangerous. Get back, you know. Um, again, in the Coppola version, there's a scene where after Harker escapes from the castle, he uh, the he ends up in a convent, and the nuns send a a note to Mina, and she immediately rushes to Transylvania to marry him. And meanwhile, she's been having this uh, illicit affair with Dracula, and 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 Dracula's uh, turned into kind of like a bestial state, and he's he's sobbing and weeping about his love, his lost love. And I was like, Dracula doesn't fucking weep. Dracula no. doesn't weep ever. Dracula no. doesn't weep. <laughs> you know? no. Well, so that brings all, up uh, all these film versions. Uh, you know, I love so many of them for so many reasons. I hate so many of them for so many reasons. But the key is. As much as they inspired me, they also never fully satisfied me, which led me to try and concoct my own answer yeah. to that riddle, you know? Well, this question's for both of you, but in your mind, is he the suave aristocrat who, you know, can blend into society, or is he a predator monster who is just out to feed himself? In your minds, which version do you see him as, or is it a combination of both? Well, he's absolutely both. You know, he is... He's aristocratic, you know, mm -hmm. in, in regards to vampire literature. There are three predecessors to Dracula in the portrayal of a, a vampire in an aristocratic sense. Mm -hmm. One is uh, Carmilla by Sheridan Le Fanu, which is a uh, kind of lesbian vampire tale. All takes place in the upper crust. Uh, orphaned girl comes to live with a well-to-do family and preys upon the daughter, daughter in a very lesbian scenario. Mm -hmm. The next is uh, Lord Ruthven in uh, uh, The Vampire by John Polidari, sometimes attributed to, well, the first part of it was apparently written by Lord Byron. The, his physician Polidari took it over and finished it. And the next is Varney the Vampire. And Varney's a little more uh, visceral, a little more brutal. But before that, there have been legends about vampires since the beginning of time, but they are always more like these revenant ghouls. They don't have this sense of sophistication and cognizance. They can't fit in and disguise themselves in human society. They're usually slathering stinky things that's st that snuck out of the grave, you know, and we address that in our first volume. Um, 
uh, uh, but Dracula is, you know, as he's portrayed in the novel, yes, he has a courtliness. He's able to like when when Harker first shows up, he realizes something's not quite right with this guy. But it does. It isn't mean like he's an animated corpse. No, nope, that doesn't immediately come out, you know. And then, of course, when he gets to London. That time when Harker sees him on the street, he's dressed in evening wear. He looks younger. He's very styled. Um, so he's fitting in somehow. Yeah, at the same time, he is he is a ravenous beast, but the way we portray him, he's not so much ravenous for blood, he's ravenous for power. And that starts at the beginning of his life. So basically, <clears throat> becoming a vampire only further enables this lust he has. You know, on our very first page, we have a thing uh, talking about how, you know, uh, history belongs to the bold, those who hunger for power. And he says, it's a, it's a craving that I have manifested for centuries, and I am such hunger incarnate. And that is everything that defines his character. The, the the power is exemplified through the blood, but it's not that he's just a glutton that wants to gorge himself on blood. He wants power. Don't you want to draw that when you hear that now? Because <laughs> I was going to say, Kelly, I, when I think of you with vampires, a lot of times I think about what you do with Batman, um, where he gets infected and when you drew him, he was beastly. Like he was on the verge of frenzy all the time because he's trying to keep his humanity, but this is taking over him. So when you hear this version of a vampire, what's going through your mind initially as to how do you want to draw this? What's, where do you start? Well, Batman the, didn't want to be, this guy wants to be right. Yeah. There you go. That's, yeah. that's the difference. Yeah. And Batman doesn't want to control or anything. Like Vlad does. Vlad wants power. Uh, his lusts are are um, to sub- dominate. Yeah, to 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 control and dominate. He he sees himself as the Lord's protector of his land, and and it's not like he defy. I mean, he believes he's doing God's will. So it's fright. It's even more frightening. He no, he's not. but he's not um but he thinks that and he thinks it's by divine right he became he's in charge and therefore he's absolved by god to do whatever it takes that's how i saw him so what do you start with is it his uh uh, garb his appearance is it his face is it just an overall it's his body language okay yeah to me it's his body language yeah that's the way kelly draws him i mean we are following the uh the physical description in the book. Yeah. Of course, in the book, the most famous discrepancy between the book and the and any film version is in the book, he wears a very large mustache, as did the original Vlad the Impaler, the real life Vlad the Impaler. We're doing that. Yeah. But as Kelly said, it's more it's more in his body language, in his it, Kelly describes it as method acting. Mm-hmm. And and it really comes across that this is an aristocratic bastard, you yeah. know, who just yeah. who just thinks like he owns every room. You know, he in a he's sense, he's Donald fucking Trump. Yeah, well, <laughs> he's, he's he's he is any one of of great power like that. He doesn't look at you straight on. He looks at you like down. Mm-hmm. Always, I always think of him. He's looking down. Um, and uh, always thinking, I could have you impaled. Yeah, <laughs> for any reason whatsoever. For any any whim like reason. Yep. You know. Um, and well, he the real one did. Yeah. You know? Uh, and so, uh, well, any guy who can command people to impale 20,000 soldiers must have had them utterly believing and trusting him. He must have had this overwhelming magnetism. For had sure. to, had to, yep. it'd be impossible not to, yep. um, his, you know, dealing with poverty by inviting everyone to dinner and burning down the building. So he didn't have any more poverty. He thought, you know, they deserved it. They weren't problem working. solved. Yeah, it's done. <laughs> so, so that guy, as far as I'm concerned, he's drawn himself. It's just like, yeah, kick people off welfare. That'll solve the problem. No, well, you you know, um, the, those uh, certainly there are things where you know they enhanced it, but but when you hear the reality of it, and hey, this is a guy getting thank you letters from the from the Vatican at that time for holding off and protecting that part of the uh christian empire because yeah because of course the the invading turks the the ottoman empire were muslim yeah 
when I went to the Vatican, they had a thing and I wanted to see the letters because they had all this stuff that you could look at. And uh, I was disappointed because someone had been there and they said, yeah, they had these letters and some one was to Vlad. And I went, but they had changed it by the time I got there. <laughs> uh, because it was, you know, they, VR. <laughs> yes, I wanted to see that letter to Vlad thanking him, you know, and his, but that, his, that's in our, in our book, you know, that's one of the reasons he, uh, so backtrack on my thought there just a bit. Um, in the novel, there are two references that Harker makes to the fact that uh, Dracula, and we have to assume this is when he was alive, attended something called the Scholomance, which is an Eastern European legend about a seminary of the dark arts high up in the mountains on the shores of something called Lake Hermannstadt, which is a, actually a fictional lake. <clears throat> um, but uh, it's a seminary for the dark arts hosted by Satan himself. And Satan takes on 10 students at a time for a tenure that lasts seven years. So in our story, Dracula goes and searches out Satan's tutelage for the purpose of defeating his enemies. And, uh, uh, you know, that that's a pretty extreme way of dealing with things. <laughs> yep. Yep. Uh, I think I think what what really made it that that whole angle so good is it's one sentence that becomes the foundation and matt matt found that and i mean i've read that a number of times and i can only imagine i must just skipped over it and not given because it uh, stoker never does anything more yeah. with it. it's just a bit um, of texture and that's that's yeah. my whole point about his portrayal of dracula he has so many of these little bits of texture that i was able to to take these textures and weave it into a tapestry you yeah. know <clears throat> we have this line that's actually in the trailer we have a trailer on the uh kickstarter page which I, I encourage everybody to go watch because it's just a blast. Uh, but the, the closing line is to defeat the godless, one must become godless. And he does. And he does. <laughs> yeah, in spades, <laughs> baby. <laughs> um no, it's 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 something that that uh uh the all of those things and you and you can see like matt said all the different films and whatever and i do love the films the same thing um uh but i liked uh i like that that there's this quality matt gives him to where you find yourself understanding him and following him and then he does something and you go oh my god oh okay <laughs> no um there were a, I told him there was a couple moments when I when I read it and I'm like going oh Matt really <laughs> <Come on." laughs> you know because I got invested into it and then that but that's good that's good storytelling that's great drama that's terrific terrific horror and rarely does something get to you in a you know you just like to enjoy it. Matt nailed it there are moments in there that I go that's frightening and it reverberates in your head doesn't rely on my what i do it, re, it it that's that's what you look for very hard to find very it, um i can only think of a few times that's happened to me but it's one this is one so i to actually be in it and not have it rely on i like it not to rely on me i like to just support it i just want to do my thing and um and i think that's that's probably the part that makes our working relationship so good yeah i was gonna say in, in this equation dude your thing is a very big thing yeah well no, no sexual puns intended my friend yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but i'll take it um <laughs> no uh you know matt matt has said so many interesting or funny things to me that have stuck with me through the years on matters like this or or what he's just said here um i love to cook but matt is like on that level that he could probably run a restaurant. So, but he said something to me uh, that I always, I stole the line and it was, um, he likes to cook because it's something very, very, very creative that he won't get reviewed on. Yeah. <laughs> that, that it won't be out there. And the you world. do at the end of the day that your career doesn't rest on. <laughs> it doesn't rest on. <laughs> and so, and I, and, and. So you plug it up, only the family knows. <laughs> only the family knows. Yeah, don't do that again. So, <laughs> Um, but there's that, that kind of a, that kind of shrewd observation, um, that I would find that he would say in his natural, regular day-to-day -day world uh, applied to this. 
And so, I mean, that's what I would see him do is make that kind of shrewd statement. Like, yeah, obviously I don't get reviewed on something I love. Only the family knows, but there's also, hey, what was he doing in London? Mm -hmm. Hey, why do they call him this? Or why did he do that? All these little things that that you go, yeah, why was I, I, I know I didn't skip read this, but those are questions I should have asked myself. And it needs what I, and Yeah, what I found is when I would tell other people this, they went, yeah, that's right. Why, you know, so everyone was doing that same reaction to it. Um, certainly, I know what I come to a story like this for, and he delivers those goods, yeah. you know? Um, and that's, and that is, if you're going to spend your day doing something, you want to love every minute of it. And that's what was going on. That's what I was going to say. I mean, for you, Kelly, it, it just means, must be so exciting because you love this stuff. And here's mm -hmm. Matt bringing, bringing a whole new light on it. And it's sort of like seeing it all over again for the first time. Well, it's like I said earlier about if there's a good thing to doing comics professionally is you get to go and meet the people you want. Right. right. You can cut through all the bullshit. And that's how I met him. The other part of it is I got a front row seat to this. I got to read this thing. I got to um, be the first audience, uh, as it were. And uh, granted, it's just he and I doing it. So we didn't even have an editor to bounce it off of. You know, we didn't have uh, we had to go by just um, our intuition. Which well, is our intuition is darn good. Let me say. Yeah, <laughs> it was. Yeah. But uh, here I got to show somebody yeah. uh, early on in the process. I bought us both wow. the Dracula whiskey tumblers. Mm -hmm. And we both saved them so that when Kelly got the script for the first time, he finally filled it and he went out back and sat down and read it mm -hmm. in his Dracula whiskey time. I got my Dracula. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, yes. And, and that, that's going to be one of the heirlooms to my kids. They can find There you go. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, no, it, it, it was, it was absolutely, I am in a position where I, would hope any artist out there will get the chance to have a script that good or a story wow. that good or something. That's that's what you hope. If comics uh, as an industry is to really survive and do well, uh, it has to have guys like Matt doing this, unencumbered and do what they do. If I were to fix Marvel or DC right now, I Matt would be in charge of all the Batman books or he would whatever he would want. I would just put him in charge of it and then say, everyone leave him Actually, alone. As a challenge, I'd rather take over the Superman books. Uh, or Superman. Oh. <clears throat> and, and then I would give the edict five years, leave him alone. Yep. And just go. I think Matt would do a wholesale genocidal impaling and then he would go. <laughs> 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 um, but that's what it, that's you know, we can only do so much because mm -hmm. it's a very ill industry. And that's when I read this, I knew I'd be off by myself. I knew I didn't want anybody involved in it. That the industry should produce and, it from the, from the regular publishing houses. And I will say that the response we're getting is, is everything we could have hoped it would be. You know, I didn't we'll think say, I, I, all duly humble, all that. I didn't expect this either. No. But but the entire process has been just killing both of us because we've had to sit on this for so long and not tell anybody. Like Kelly, you tell me, I gotta tell somebody. I'm like, no, shut up. <laughs> well, and, people, uh, you know, so people... finally, uh, when we announced it the other day, uh, I got a, a, a message on uh, Twitter from a fellow named Leslie Klinger, who is considered one of the world's foremost Dracula scholars. Uh, he wrote uh, uh, the most recent annotated version of Dracula. Did a large annotated version of Sherlock Holmes, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, Frankenstein, H.P. Lovecraft. This guy really knows his shit. And uh, so he contacted me and I, I wrote him back and I said, oh, man, Les, I would love if I would be very honored if you would read this and give us your unfettered opinion. You know, if it turns out to be a, a quote or a blurb that we can use, great. If it's a little admonishment try and try and suck it up and, and take that in and everything. And he gave us this just glowing quote. Yeah. And I felt like, you know, as, as Kelly said, you know, you went to the professor and the professor gave you an A plus. Yeah. Know? It was great. <laughs> it was great. Um, no, it, it's, and look, conversely, I'm hearing from a lot of artists right now saying how unbelievably good this looks. 
Yeah. And, and I will again, I, I know I'm a broken record, but Matt had an intent, uh, had a, a vision of how this was to look, how it was to be colored, how it was to be presented. And he perfect wanted, segue, pal. Yeah. And he wanted he wanted this this thing in his head. And he basically said, you know, 70s, heavy metal, that whole thing. Uh, he was very, very uh, clear to me he says I don't want old school in just that sense but I want it done the way they did it and I want us to present it, it will look new and I went sure fine um, yeah I I you know I mean color's always been a huge part of of my approach to comics you know it's uh I always keep coming back to an old Edgar Allan Poe quote which is in a short story of which Poe of course was one of the acknowledged masters <clears throat> in a short story every word has to tell you can't have any wasted shit and and in comics it's the same way so i've always approached my comics that you shouldn't be able to tell the story just from the script you should you shouldn't be able to get the full experience just from reading the script you shouldn't be able to tell what's going on just from looking at the art the art shouldn't absolutely breathe without the color and of course the lettering needs to come in to give you the soundtrack and uh and uh, so coming into this, you know, I always had this, uh, I've always loved Kelly's art so much. And I always felt most people didn't know how to color Kelly because Kelly already, he draws shadow, he draws theater, he draws atmosphere and shadow and dimension. And colorists tend to lay their heavy shit down on that and try and make it darker and more atmospheric. And it's like, no, he gave you enough of that. You, you don't need any more. And I always had this attitude is like Kelly's stuff needs to be colored vibrantly so that those shadows kind of pulsate with a threat and a menace. And you get to see all his magnificent fine line art, you know? And uh, so when we finally uh, settled on Jose Villarubia uh, for a colorist and we, uh, I thought of him mainly as a result of the fact that uh, Jose was most recently uh, doing restorative work on DC's, uh, uh, fancy editions of uh, Ryson's uh, Swamp Thing and also do a restorative work on uh, Corbin's uh, uh, collective library that Dark Horse is reissuing. And uh, so when I talked to Kelly about this, I expressed these thoughts and I said, Kelly, look, we're looking for Italian giallo films here. You know, we specifically want something like Dario Gento's Suspiria or Mario Bava's uh, uh, Black Sabbath, both of which when you watch them, they're lit up like a, fucking pinball machine and yet they're they're spooky as shit because again this this there's a radiance to the shadows and the evil there's not just darkness you know i hate horror movies and this is a contemporary horror movie thing where everything's just fucking black and, and you're constantly like you know and that's that to my mind that's the director pulling going cheap you know like like just making you making you like stare and stare and stare so they can hit you with a jump scare you know, and it's like, yeah, that's just yeah, fuck anybody. It's some student filmmaker could do that, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, Jose really understood that and and brought it in spades. And and Kel was thrilled. I was thrilled. Well, just I like I like a book where I can enjoy reading it and enjoy the individual panels or something on their own. I don't need it to cultivate into an event or a scene or a something to a work. I enjoy the journey of it. Horror does that better than anything because you have so many other things you have to do to accomplish that moment. Um, uh, dread and atmosphere are wholly and, reliant on color. And and the and and narratively, you know, horror. You know, Keller was talking about how horror does all those things. You know, but narratively, horror is best when when it's not about the scares it's about yeah. something else and the yeah. scares sneak up on you yeah you know um uh i always point to uh uh the the really shocking uh uh horror, turned into a horror author uh ira levin who wrote rosemary's baby and uh and uh, uh stepford wives and boys from brazil and the boys from brazil right so here's this middle class jewish guy from new york who wrote the the ultimate feminine feminist horror story, the Stepford Wives, yeah. who wrote the ultimate uh, 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 
mat uh, maternal horror story, you know, uh, uh, Rosemary's Baby. And of course, you know, the Jewish aspect, of course, he wrote a terrific horror story with the boys from Brazil, too. Yeah, but those are all about those are all about inherent fears and aren't really full of scares. The scares come later. Yeah. You know, one of my favorite, favorite vampire movies is uh, Let the Right One In. And it's got its fair share of scares, but it's got it far more prevalent in that story is a poignancy because it's about loneliness. It's about the loneliness of being a bullied 12 year old boy. And it's about the loneliness of being a, an isolated 200 year old vampire. Mm -hmm. And all that just permeates that story. And you really, really feel it so that well, I they... think we've always, I think we've always reacted to that because loneliness is a big part of all the great horror, all the monsters. Yeah. Yeah. Well, isolation, um, isolation. Yeah, they're I'm all... alone. I'm alone. Uh, yeah. Karloff looking for a friend. Um, I'm alone in the dark and there's right, shadows uh, all around me. You know? The Wolfman alone with Larry Talbot alone with this thing and no one will believe him. And you know uh, what, you guys, if you ever want to stand, understand gothic horror, next time your power goes out, light a couple candles and try and make your way around your house because wow. that used to be the only lighting anybody ever yes. had. <laughs> yeah. And when you're carrying a candle, you realize... You can't see anything beyond like the three or four foot radiance that that candle will And how be. dark, how yeah. dark it gets. How dark. The dark yeah. is really fucking dark. Yeah. And, and it really uh, stirs the imagination and stirs uh, the dread, as Kelly said, that will lurk yeah. in the shadows, you know? Yeah. Well, I always make my wife go outside to see if there's a problem still, so. <laughs> uh, this one is for both of you guys, but when you're doing a horror book, you know, you want to tell your story, but at the same time in your mind, you want to get pulling as much of an audience as possible. How do you sort of edit yourself as to, is this too much gore? Is this too scary? Am I doing too much? Is it something that's conscious or are you just going to do your thing? And Oh, Jesus, dude. In the aftermath of like Saw and Hostel and all the torture porn. <laughs> I don't, I don't think there is too much. No, like, I do. Is, I do. Is to really draw people in again, as I said, with that human story. Yeah. Right. You, you really want you really want people to care, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I like to do things that are little that aren't big in that sense um, uh, that you have to look and you'll see it. And that's like occasionally in the mayhem, put a child in it. And and I don't draw attention to it. I don't make it the main focus. It's just like that's that's how horrible Vlad is. I mean, Matt doesn't have to say it on it. It's just there. It, you do the story yourself. What did this child do? Why did they, it didn't even matter what wrong you place, do. wrong time? Oh wrong time, man! Yeah. And but it's just a little thing I'll put in there occasionally. Or, um, I think what you also do is you you realize that if you're going to horrify somebody, you have to differentiate it from terror. Uh, horror is a revulsion. Terror is a shock. So you have to look at where those moments call for either of them. Um, I think there's scenes that that Matt wrote where they're very deliberate, and you know, in some cases, you you know he's up to something. You don't know exactly what it is. Um, he's, and then as it becomes fully realized, it becomes horrible. And then when he does it, it becomes terror. And that's that wonderful procession to that moment. Um, other times, Matt will just have him, you know, you can tell. the. I, I think one of my favorite things in there is a couple of times you can see the wheels turning in his head. And you know something bad's going to happen. Um, you become a, a very, very careful. I, I, I mean, you think as, as the reader very careful of what you'd ever say or do around this man. I was going to say, and ideally, you know, as a writer, that moment that Kelly's talking about there, you want the, the reader or the viewer to go, yeah, I'd probably do that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, and, then, and then immediately like go, Oh, what did I just say that? <laughs> I kept, I, and I mean, we've said it before. I kept, I kept beginning to like him or understand him. And then Matt would do something like cold water on you. No. And that's what I like. I like my, I like uh, Dracula in particular. Um, and uh, uh, just this, this awful, horrible, fascinating person. And I will say, uh, uh, I keep coming back to that Hannibal Lecter uh, analog. Um, it's one thing they lost with Hannibal, you know, after a while, you know, in the portrayals on screen, he just becomes kind of a, a, a spitting maniac, you know, right. And they lose the uh, they lose the elegance. They lose the, uh, the 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 sense of sophisticated veneer 
an under which is flying a monster, you know? Yeah. I want to jump back for something that like Kelly just said about a little detail he would do, like putting a child into a scene. Matt, as for you as a writer, to have a partner like that who can add to a scene that's already well written, but to have someone whose brain can do that, I mean, that must be such a thrill. Dude, again, the entire time I was scripting, I, I thought I thought I'm writing this to Kelly. I can't wait yeah. to see how Kelly can draw this because he's going to draw the shit out of this. Yeah, <laughs> and then and then it would come back and it'd be like, oh, it's better than I imagined, <laughs> you know, because <laughs> uh, he would just take it that next step further. You know, I mean, uh, everything I described, he would just add a little more, a little more oomphism, you know, a little more, a little more decorative beauty, a little more her- horrible uh, shadows, a little more, just a little more great shit every every step of the way. But when a new world is opened up, it should do that. It should make yeah. you. Yeah. Um, it should make you want to go. Yeah, because I, I, I have to. It, it looked so effortless. I had to admit. I had to imagine you weren't thinking about it that much. No, yeah. that's just the way you ended up drawing it. You it's know? the way it was. It, it, yeah. it, it's the way it was. If it, I think you mentioned uh, in the story several times that. Uh, they'll they he would go somewhere or do something and I wanted to make it different every time I didn't want to do the same images over and over because then I, I felt at that point it makes the world bigger and certainly when he's dealing in the scolamons I wanted that to be a, a just this bizarre place well and you had to, you had you had to figure that yeah it, it would not be a, a set in stone sort of locale you know no, and that's I one didn't... thing i like about the coppola film actually he he portrays the inside of castle dracula as this shifting reality that yeah. you know that it's it's a living dream kind of you know and, and kelly really pulled that off in yeah. uh, in the scenes with the scolamons the, the i sacred... wanted it i didn't want it to be like a regular place yeah mm-hmm. i wanted it to be it, well the guy running it is the devil yeah yeah I know issue one is is still and, being um, worked on. And Matt's oh. portrayal up now. Say it again. You blipped out there, Oren. Sorry. Say it again. Oh I, no, my my computer froze up for a second there. I'm sorry. I was just asking. Um, I know you know episode you have still working on it now. How no, no, no. Episode episode one's completely done. The book the book's oh, yeah. completely done. We're halfway through the second one. Okay, so how far ahead are you in your mind as to where the story is going to go? I, I have I have the the basic framework of the first four graphic novels okay. uh, uh, blocked out, yeah. And and as far as physical work goes, uh, number one is completely done, top to bottom, um, uh, colored, lettered, ready to go. Uh, number two is I'm about halfway through writing it. Kelly's about a third of the way through drawing it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's kind of Matt. Has and a, it's a bitch too, man. It's yeah. awesome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I kept thinking, how's my, he gonna top when these wife keeps, come in? How's he gonna top the first one? <laughs> uh, my wife keeps saying, You're gonna get in trouble for this. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is, you know, and I'm going good because it it's it is uh I, I it's the same thing, but there's a, a certain amount of black humor to it. There's a certain amount of of uh of very rarely do you get this sometimes we're but matt gets across the result of the curse on him he, the, he starts to get it you start to get it like wow this the is the thing we, we keep searching for in this narrative is it has to be super familiar as dracula and it has to be brand new in a way that you've never seen mm-hmm. and and i really think we're hitting that on all notes you know and Oren, what what matt did and it should be emphasized they're all standalone stories and so if you just read the second one we're talking about and didn't read the first or the third or the fourth, it would work. Wow. Uh, Matt's, Matt had told me what he really was uh, excited about was that you could do that. But mm-hmm. if you put it all together, it was an epic, you know. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a much larger narrative together. But hey, it's hey, a pretty it's, large narrative in each in each chapter. Yeah, It's yeah. our Lord of the Rings with Vlad. You know, that's what it is. It's it's an <laughs> epic over time. Um yeah. Uh, and what that does to him, I think t- uh, uh, the thing that I like that Matt does is he starts emphasizing very subtly time. Okay. And uh, there's the great line: "There's some things worse than than death." Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Clearly, the meaning not dying, and that really is 
what starts changing the objectives for him. Mm -hmm. I was very aware of that in doing this. I'm like going, yeah, you know, when you're a little kid, you think living forever would be great. And then you, when you get older, you go, eh, I don't think living forever would be great. I don't <laughs> want it to happen real quick. And I don't want to do it screaming. But, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, that, 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 that's, there's a truth to that. You know, mm -hmm. it's the old biblical curse. You're going to live forever. Um, and Matt incorporates that without saying it, just letting the effect happen. Mm -hmm. We've spoken about the the Dracula and the meeting before, and, and my last question for you guys is: Besides, we'll take Lugosi and maybe Max Shrek out of the equation. Top two on screen Draculas for both of you guys. Well, Christopher Lee for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Beyond that, it's a mix because uh, nobody quite attains the heights he does. Um, uh. Here again, I'll just come back to the. I, I think Gary Oldman was a terrible choice for for Dracula. Um, oh. and, um, he's got a few good moments in the castle, but once he gets to London, he's never scary again. He, yeah. He's a he's a wimpy goth douchebag. Um, uh, 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 I like the Louis Jordan BBC adaptation, but Louis Jordan's a short little guy with a contemporary hairdo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, if you're gonna acquiesce to the romantic version of dracula i kind of like the langella film the frank langella film a lot of good imagery in that movie. a lot yeah, of it it's terrific but you know he's got this 80s blow-dried hairdo yeah. that kind of takes you out of the moment uh there again it's just uh, every every different version just doesn't add up to me um you know i love christopher lee's version I, I wish he had more lines i wish uh i wish he was a little more uh on well, stage what? What he, what he gets that uh, probably why Matt and I like him obviously the best is he's not a romantic character. Mm -hmm. He's not into romance. He's feeding on everybody. Um, well, but he maybe, he's he's a lustful character. Yeah, he he'll use it against a woman. Mm -hmm. He'll use it. Uh, he will he will use that. Uh, you know, it's interesting because when he's going to be a vampire with a guy, it's just to gut and kill them. Yeah, with right. Woman who right. goes through this thing like a snake, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, well, like Eve, like Eve at the with the apple. And I think um, the blood tastes better when the girl is being seduced. You know, that's. Uh, uh, I kind of like Jack Palance in the, uh, the TV brilliant. version. Yep, yep. Um, that one was uh, scripted by Richard Matheson, who of course has contributed so much to uh, vampire lore by uh, yep. writing the the novel uh, I Am Legend and also the uh, screenplay for the Night Stalker, the original Night Stalker movie. Yeah. Um, the Palance's version is the one that first introduces the reincarnated love aspect, which again, I've already said, I, I don't really care for. Um, but Palance's version, uh, has a physicality, has almost an, uh, an action movie sort of physicality. You know, you, you get to see men coming up and shooting him in the gut with a, a pistol. It doesn't affect him and he throws him off a staircase. You know, you get to see his, his actual f physical prowess and, you know, yeah, and I'm, I, and I know it's not, uh, I, I, they didn't use the name and they wanted to, but they felt there would be problems with universal films, but the count Yorga films really kind of mm -hmm. get what Dracula is because that one they specialize in is cruelty, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. His, his real cruelty and what he does to people and, and almost his sadistic joy in that. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, they'll show, uh, one of my favorite scenes ever in a vampire film ever is actually in Count Yorga. And it's not a monstery thing, but it, it's chilling in its own way um, that he's at a party and it's a Halloween party and they're all dressed up. And obviously he looks like Dracula and he's speaking to everyone and saying different things. And there's a deaf person comes up and they say, oh, I'm sorry, he's deaf. We can't understand it. And without saying a word, he starts doing sign to the guy because mm -hmm. Dracula understands all languages. And it's just mm -hmm. something, you know, mm -hmm. he signs back to the guy and the guy signs back. And, and all of it, that's that's beautiful. Yeah. In keeping with that, you know, when we we're putting together, uh, if everybody goes to the uh, to our Kickstarter page, there's a, a really fun trailer for the book there. And yeah. uh, and we we got a uh, the guy that did our video uh, uh, hooked us up with a voice actor. And there was some back and forth about, you know, do we have a Romanian accent? Do we not have a Romanian accent? And we finally elected for no, because in the uh, in the novel itself, Harker makes two yeah. comments about how good Dracula's English is. Yeah. 
and you know the the you know i i good evening that sort of shit that that's actually from the lugosi film version and the yeah. fact that lugosi himself could not speak very good english at that point and in fact had to learn a lot of his lines phonetically and i think uh, you're right i think you're right matt because the first time you see hammer do it uh lee speaks no, nice. he, does, he doesn't have an accent. No, yeah, no. beautiful English. Be no. Like very. And, and, and in fact, in the book, it, uh, Harker says something about you know he spoke excellent English with a strange intonation. Yes. And when I hear that that term "strange intonation," to my mind, that doesn't mean he's got a Romanian accent. That means he hasn't spoken to a living human being in a hundred years. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. so. Or and nothing conversational orders. Yes, maybe. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, Go yeah. get this. That's yeah. Right. Yes, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Yeah. 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 And that so was probably same. in Romanian, so he wouldn't even have to. Yeah, I would, yeah, yeah, <laughs> or whatever they spoke, yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, I, I think you guys make some good points, and even though I did enjoy Gary Oldman, I don't want Matt you know, <laughs> slapping me to the screen. That's all right, man. Mm -hmm. I know I'm a little bit out in the field in my dislike <laughs> of that movie. Again, I, break... what I love about that movie is Coppola's filmmaking. His, yeah. his uh, how he wouldn't use CGI. And he insisted on using all these old school filmmaking techniques. And there's a huge, huge element of cinema in that film. And Anthony Hopkins is good in it. Oh, yeah. I don't like Hopkins. <laughs> I, now, see, I do like him. I like him when he does the well work. Now, the best part, though, and I agree with Matt on like 99% of this. My favorite part about uh, the Coppola version is I went to go see it with my wife and my dad and my wife had to sit next to my dad from where I was. So through all those uncomfortable scenes with the brides and all the, you know, my <laughs> wife had to sit there next to my dad. Next to your dad. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Oh, oh God, there's tits. <laughs> there's, there's, there's the, uh, oh, there's he's the, lick, she's licking his blood out of his nipple. <laughs> yeah, um, the, the, the brides giving uh, oral sex to, to yep. Keanu. Yep. Yeah, all that was beautifully staged. Loved all beautifully, that. beautifully. It's just my 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 poor wife it just punched me in the arm when we got out of there. And, and <laughs> I, I will say the the three casting uh, uh, choices I really like are Lucy Western as uh, three uh, suitors. Yeah. So uh, Carrie Elways as Lord uh, uh, Lord uh, Homewood. Uh, uh, um, Bill Campbell Grant. as Quincy Morris and. Uh, uh, Oh God! Who plays Who plays Doctor Seward? Um, Richard Richard Grant. Richard E. Grant. Yes, yeah. Yeah. all three of them really fit in their mold very very well. Did you like Tom Waits as uh, Renfield? No, no. Okay, two I over the top. That. Two over the top. Two Tom yeah. Waits. I couldn't I couldn't separate him. Yeah. From I, Tom I agree. I, I agree with you. Yeah. Um, they were they weren't like you like know he, what I, he's speaking. And I'm like that guy doesn't speak British. That guy's no, not. British. I think he's what Coppola was trying to do was the like Kubrick casting Kubrick. Will, yeah, they were they were trying to back it with a big a big star. Yeah, what place, Kubrick you know? would always go get a you big star. Need to get asses in the seats. You know that was that was it. But um. But what Kubrick could do was get was get the right guy that you wouldn't think would work, like a, yeah, a for yeah. Barry Lyndon, Ryan. Yeah, uh, you never would have thought that. Yeah, never, right. never. But he got it. So yeah. I think Coppola was trying to do that kind of casting, like you don't. It's edgy and cool, and they're hip, and you know them. Uh, and then you go, Dad yeah, didn't work. Okay, Oren, let me let me leave you with this one. Uh, I don't know if you know, but the final casting for Dracula mm -hmm. came down to Gary Oldman, who of course is about five six. Yeah. And, you know, can't really grow a beard or a mustache. You know, when he gets there in London, he looks like, dude, just shave that shit. What are you doing, man? <laughs> uh, it was between him and Gabriel Byrne. Oh. oh. And Gabriel Byrne was going through a messy divorce. Yeah. And couldn't commit. Yeah. And I just think, fucking A, that would have been so much better. <laughs> well, how cool, because he played Byron in... in uh, yeah, this tall, lordly, you know, hawk-nosed, yeah. you know, dark, sweeping hair. Would have been awesome. Well, but, casting's 90% uh, of it, right? Yeah. Right. I, I was going to leave you guys with one, and I, I hope it doesn't, you know, get me thrown off the stage. Ruffle any but... feathers? <laughs> <laughs> Ruffle uh, any bat wings? <laughs> I, I had to look up his name. Duncan Regair. From the movie yep. Monster Squad. Okay, Monster Squad. He's excellent. Yeah, okay. he yeah, is he an is. excellent. Yep. yep, and he's terrifying. And yep. it's it's really the last great Dracula performance as Dracula. Right. Um, he's, he's very much he's he's in the Lugosi mode uh, yeah. mold though. You know, yeah. it's it's the Lugosi. But he but he's a cruel man. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I think I think when he picks up the little girl is, I mean I that movie has a lot going for it, and that is one of the things. That that's adult right there. When he as opposed to the guy who plays the Euro trash version of Dracula in Van Helsing, 
Yeah. You know, it was like, I forget that guy's name. It was just like, oh, oh really? Yeah. He's, got, he's got a stylish ponytail. Awesome. Oh, <laughs> I, I will always blame, I will always blame Steven Summers. Cause that was, that was a, uh, and the kitchen sink two movie where you just uh, trim 50%, trim 80% out of it and focus on something, you yeah. know? And we're back. This was a great interview. And I'm really looking forward to this series of books. Uh, the Saint Twilight, that's for damn sure. These these vampires are not going to be sparkling. All right. And uh, this is certainly not Hotel Transylvania. Uh, how many more Dracula references can we make, guys? Uh, Oren, wow. great interview, though, nonetheless. This was uh, very interesting and um, really cool guys. I'm glad I was able to slip in my uh, Dracula from Monster Squad reference in there, and they appreciated it. Uh, I have to say, uh, Mr. Wagner's Gary Oldman bashing did hurt my heart a bit. I grew up loving that film, and now I don't know what to think and feel anymore. So, uh, you know, but uh, such cool guys. Like I said before, everything they told me about this Dracula project, it's going to be absolutely phenomenal. Or an amazing job. Still jealous that you got to talk to these guys. <laughs> uh, hopefully we will have them back on especially um well both but we we've done a kelly jones interview before we'd love to have matt wagner all to ourselves so uh we'll keep our fingers crossed as you do thank you everybody for listening thank you for taking it in on youtube please remember to rate review and subscribe and thank you to our friends at tomorrow's publishing t-w-o-m-o-r-r-o-w-s dot com please go check them out And we will see you next time. Peace.